Awesome, thank you. So, Finance 101, our plan for today, introduction, um, basic personal finance for the medical student transitioning to the junior doctor, things to look out for and next steps. So, my name is Dr. Sai Rasha. I went to Warwick Medical School. I'm now an Oxford Deanery as a foundation year two doctor. Um, let me make it larger, of course. I would try and do it full screen, but then I can't see the chat at all. Um, so let me see if I can get rid of the toolbars. There we go. Is that any better with the toolbars gone? Let's get rid of the notes section as well. Right, there we go. Um, so basics of personal finance. Um, you are graduating. I hope you've had a student current account, um, which means that you get 0% overdraft. Um, and some other perks, like probably a rail card. Um, if you did have a student current account, you will now be transferred onto a graduate current account, um, which also means that you get an extension of between one and two years of that 0% overdraft, which gives you a chance to pay it back. And I would definitely very, you know, slowly, but definitely pay it back because once you get past your period of the graduate bank account, it can be very expensive to have that overdraft. The next thing I want to talk to you about is the Lifetime ISA. If you haven't opened one already, please go away after this talk and open one. I have mine with um, Beehive. Um, it gives you 3% interest, which isn't super fantastic, but the special bit about it is up, you can save up to £4,000 4, a year. Um, and for all of that, you get a 25% government bonus every year on top of that. So even if you could put in, you know, even a hundred a year, two hundred a year from your from your savings, that's still a twenty five percent bonus that you wouldn't have gotten previously. And if you haven't already, then I would sign up for discount websites. So NHS discounts is one of them. Um, VC or voucher codes is another one. Um, and the blue light card, which is actually extremely good value. Um, you can also sign up for that as well with your um, new ID or your new email address. So, the current account. We already talked about a bit of it. It'll, it's now going to be a graduate account. Um, you can get other perks with it, so vouchers, rail cards. Um, you can get things like taste cards. So have a shop around. Um, a website that I really like for these things is Money Saving Expert because it does tend to present it really nicely and tends to be very up to date. So have a look at that. Um, the Lifetime ISA, as I was saying, is a type of um, tax-free savings account. Basically, you can only use it for three reasons. I've only included two here. The third, well, first reason is to buy your first home. The second reason is for retirement, so when you turn 60. And the third reason is if you're terminally ill and you have less than 12 months to live. And how this works is you're, you put in, you're allowed to put in a maximum of £4,000 a year. And for that, whatever you've deposited into that account, you get a 25% bonus from the government at the end of the tax year. Or usually when you've deposited it, you tend to just get it about the month later. And the good thing about this is that you can, when, if you don't use it to buy your first home, you can use it for retirement. And what you can also do is you can use it for your first home and then to continue to use it for your retirement. It's not just one or the other. You can actually, you know, this is what we did. We, we emptied our um, lifetime ISAs when we bought our first home, but we continue to save in it because we can use that for our retirement now. So it's not just a one or the other. You can actually use it for both. So I'd open one of those. A word on savings accounts. So basically, get yourself a LISA. That, but the LISA does mean that you're not. You have to lock away that money because if you take out money for any other reason than the reasons I just described, then you will be charged a 25% um, fine on the on that, and it's not a 25% of your original deposits, which means it's not just the 25% government bonus that gets taken away. It's a 25%. Um, Thing on the entire balance you actually lose a little bit more so if you you know if you can't afford to put that money away and you need it available a bit more then um, I you know be careful about putting that in the LISA um, Ellen's asked a question what happens if I already have a help to buy ISA but want a lifetime ISA too you can open you can have both at the same time 
some things um what i t but you can only use one of those to buy your first home and with the help to buy isa you can only put in 200 pounds a month at most whereas with a lifetime isa you could put 4000 pounds a year so what we did was to maximize our what deposit we had available for our house we decided to empty our help to buy isa and put it into our lifetime isa yes you can pay into both in one financial year help to buy isa and it that'll come those limits will come under the to, the full 20000 isa limits for for depositing in your isa and you can use your help to buy isa to buy your first house even though the rules are a bit more stringent for the help to buy isa you you if you look into it a little bit more the price of the houses that you're allowed to use it on are a little bit lower than they are for the lifetime isa do you have to buy a house in the uk yes you do it's not for buying houses abroad um you could get a regular savings account which i think is worth doing interest rates are rising a little bit um and they're not super great but a regular saving account means you should at least have something in your emergency fund something that's easily accessible but it's a separate pot of money so you're not tempted to spend it um think about access do you need to you know that you can get um savings accounts that are fixed term which means you pay a penalty if you access the money too early can you afford to lock it away but then they do get better interest rates so it's thinking about how much access you need to that money um how um how happy you are for it to be locked away and how much return you can get on that money and you can have multiple ices so basically you can um we'll go into this a little bit more um santiago has said would you advise against elisa then if planning to work abroad at a later date um if you're planning never to come back then i would probably say don't bother with elisa but if you're not if sorry if you're not yeah did i say that right if you're not planning to come back i wouldn't bother with elisa but if you are planning to come back then that will just sit there and grow and be there for you to use when you're 60 so um you can you can do that um with it so it's it's up to you basically of what you plan on doing in the future personally if you plan on staying here just for a short period of time going away and unlikely to ever come back i wouldn't bother opening one does it matter which provider for the license you use no it doesn't um it just depends on the interest rates and how competitive they are at the moment beehive um has a 3% interest rate um and so that's why i used i'm using beehive but you can use money box if you prefer and you, if you prefer their interface and how they work then absolutely go for that it really doesn't matter because those interest rate figures are really small it's the 25% bonus that you're really after so discounts um you can still get your student discounts for a bit you can also get your nhs discounts now so lots of places offer nhs discounts and always ask so nando's has a 20% nhs discount up to 4 pounds KFC I think had a 25 but that might have gone down. Um lots of places have NHS discounts and then the blue light card is really good. It's such good value. You basically sign up and you get to access all these different offers and I use the blue light card for things like airport parking. You excuse me, you get a little bit of money off some holidays. It's actually quite good. Um and you get some money in like Danelm for example. So um you know it's it's worth having. So things to look out for. you are now an, basically an employed individual and something you need to really keep an eye on is is called your credit score i i hope most of you have heard of what a credit score is if you haven't don't worry um i'm going to pop a link in the um chat at the moment just bear with me um of a an article i wrote about the credit score but also it gives you the um the uh webinar that i did on it um so you can to look into that in lots more detail but the special thing about the credit score is that um you will be assessed on your credit score um for when you're applying for a mortgage or when even when you're renting they sometimes run a credit check even when you're getting a um a new uh, mobile phone um contract they'll run a credit check so it's very important to make sure that you keep an eye on your credit score um and how this works is basically you need to make sure that you pay all your bills on time oh my has my thingy disappeared everybody let me see uh share screen this screen 
yeah, there we go. So you need to sign up for somewhere that I I use free. I don't I don't use Equifax or Experian because you have to pay for them. Um, Money Supermarket and ClearScore are just as good. ClearScore is fantastic because you can actually get your entire credit report for completely for free. And the way to make sure that your credit score is you're on top of it is to make sure that you are on the electoral register to vote where you live because um, it shows that you're reliable. It shows that you um, are, are living in a, in a reliable accommodation, if that makes sense. Um, make sure you pay all your bills on time. Do not pay your credit cards late. Do not miss any payments, even for a mobile phone because all of that can mess up your credit score. Don't have too many credit or store cards open at once. Don't use too much of your credit cards either. Um, only use what you can afford to pay back. So um, if you want some more information on the credit score, please please read that article because it is so detailed and my webinar is even more detailed. So I don't want to sort of spend too much time on it at the moment. Um, okay, let's move on. So you're planning for FY1. We've talked about graduate bank accounts and that your bank account will likely be switching, which will give you a bit of time to, of, to pay back that 0% um, you know, overdraft that you've had over med school. You'll have new bills to pay like council tax and that uh, council tax is quite a lot actually. So with council tax, if you live on your own or you live with someone else that doesn't have to pay council tax, like another student or someone who's disabled, um, depending on the type of disability, it has to be an intellectual disability, I believe, you get a 25% discount. However, if you're living with other people or um, and if you live on your own as well, then you get a 25% discount. Um, but if you're living with other people who also have to pay council tax, like other junior doctors, um, then you have to pay full council tax. And just remember to budget that in your monthly rental costs because it can be surprisingly high. Um, you can reclaim tax on certain um, things like your GMC fees, any Royal College fees, exam fees for any Royal Colleges, any courses with Royal Colleges. And this works by um, you open a government gateway account with HMRC and you can do that all online. In fact, I might, I might just um, pop that link in there as well for you. So, government gateway. So, with this, you can basically open this and see what information the government, you can also reclaim on your stethoscope, yes. As long as the stethoscope was bought in a year where you also paid income tax. If you bought your stethoscope at the start of med school, you were unlikely to be paying income tax, so it's unlikely you'll be able to claim for that. Um, so um, you apply for your um, tax relief on these um, on these different things there. And I learned the hard way that HMRC's system doesn't allow you to see what you've already applied for. So make just keep a spreadsheet of the things you've already applied for and what you haven't applied for because um, when you start applying it, you might not remember what you applied for previously. So just keep, keep a track of, of what you have applied for. Um, Ellen, if you have over 4K in help to buy ISA and looking to buy a house this year, better keeping the help to buy ISA rather than using lifetime ISA is capped to transferring 4K. Um, yeah, just use your help to buy ISA if you're buying the house this year and there's not very much in the other one. Depends. So, for example, if you already like how much it depends how much you have in the lifetime ISA, for example, whichever one would give you the greatest amount, if that makes sense. Um, but personally, if I were you and you're buying a house this year, you've the more you've got more in your help to buy than keep it in your help to buy. Um, will this be uploaded onto the Mind the Bleep YouTube channel? Yes, it will. Um, this is the same advice for tax refund as well. Um, yeah, so it's not yeah, so it's not technically a tax refund unless you've overpaid tax. It's for tax relief is the is the thing that I'm talking about. Tax refund is likely um, something you might be able to do if you overpaid income tax. For the LISA, is there a major difference between cash versus doctor and sales? That's a good question. So basically, a cash ISA means you make a small amount of interest income, which is three percent, and then you make your twenty five percent bonus. Whereas in a cash stocks and shares ISA, LISA, depending on how you do it, and I do have a lovely article on the different types of ISAs in uh, 
in this bit, um, which tells you a bit more about it. Um, especially the webinar, I go into a bit more detail there, so I'm just going to drop that link. Um, and so basically, um, with the stocks and shares, you can either choose to have it managed for you, or you can manage it by yourself, and you can make greater returns. So this, don't quote me on this, but you can, if you invest in a good, solid um, ETF like the S&P 500, you can make an average 8% return, but this is over a long period of time. This is not for short-term investing. You have to put keep your money in there and hold it for a good 5 to 10 years before you see those kinds of returns. But you can make greater returns in a stocks and shares ISA than you can in a cash ISA. And what you can do is you can stop deposit four thousand pounds in both of them, either of you know, as in both of them together. But you only get the twenty five percent bonus on one of them. You won't get it for both of them. But at least you'll still have four thousand pounds saved away in a tax free LISA that's making a little bit of money whilst you're also doing the stocks and shares. For the credit score, if you're not British, then I assumed you would not be on the electoral register. Um, so. You, then would you be up to date with the credit score? So there are lots of other factors that affect the credit score, but you, you should be on the electoral register. You, you, you are allowed to, um, uh, it's, you don't have to be British to vote. You can actually, um, if you have um, indefinite leave to remain, you can still vote. I would double check if you, um, you can just let them know, the council know that you're on the, um, that, that you live there. You might not have voting rights, but I think you do. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I would definitely double check. It's really easy to do online with your local um, council. You just literally type in whichever council you're in and join the electoral register and then you do it online. It's really easy. Is that bought within the same calendar year or tax year? I think, are you referring to your house? I mean, honestly, like, it doesn't really matter, does it? It depends on how much you've got in each one. So for example, if, you, if you're if you going to do it in the next tax year, then how much limit have you got left in either account and how much can you maximize one of the accounts? It's really difficult to just give you a generic answer without looking at the numbers themselves, which I'm, I'm not going to do. Um, uh, what kind of things can you claim tax relief for? So you can claim tax relief for your GMC fees, your Royal Society fees, any exam fees with the Royal Colleges, any courses with the Royal Colleges like BSS if you're paying for that yourself. Um, you can also claim tax relief for um, if you have to wash your uniform at home, um, if at any point your work requires you to work from home you can get a little bit of tax relief on that as well. Do you still get the 25% in the stocks and shares LISA? Yes, you do. But like I said, you can actually have both a stocks and shares LISA and a, and a cash LISA open together and deposit in both of them. But you only get the deposit in one of them. Um, ALS, uh, yes, you can. Um, yes, you can get tax relief on that as well if you're paying for it yourself. Um, how do you go about claiming tax relief? It's Yes, yeah, so I popped the link in there. You sign up for a government gateway account and it's in the income tax section. And you can say claim. You, there's an option to claim tax relief, and it's all quite straightforward from there. Okay, so um, I've got a budgeting spreadsheet um, that you can get. Um, let me see. Where is my budgeting spreadsheet? I think that you can sign up for it. Oh yeah, here's your yeah. Uh, where is this budgeting spreadsheet? Um, I do have a budgeting spreadsheet and I need to figure out how you guys can access it. Um, I will find that out for you guys. Um, but basically it just tracks all your income and expenses and they're simple budgeting spreadsheets and apps all over the place. Um, what I said, even if you do something stupid like, you know, write it on a bit of paper, just just keep track. Don't don't be, you know, just putting caution to the wind um, and keep track. You don't actually have to be super anal about it. You just need to have an idea of how much is coming in, how much is coming out, and can you afford it? Um, what if I decide to locum? So basically, um, final financial considerations of doing locum work. So when you're in F1, 
you can only locum in the hospital that you're working at as long as you've done the specialty already. So you can't do a locum in a different specialty and you can't do a locum in a different hospital either um, as a doctor. If you've been like a nurse or a HCA before and you've got your pin and all of that, you can do what you want. But as a doctor, as your F1, you don't, you can't do that. So your F1 locums, if you do them in the specialty that you're working in, um, oh yes, it is. Thank you. It's on my Instagram page. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So basically, when you do a locum with your um, trust, they'll basically just pay you the same way they pay your normal wages, um, and the tax will be deducted at source. You don't actually have to do any additional tax um, forms. You don't have to send anything. It's all done that way. Um, invoicing through your own limited company. This is more complex. You need an accountant for it, and this is something really consultants do it's it's not really something you need to worry about at f1 to f2 even core training um ensure you're on the correct tax code now this is a big deal especially with locums because sometimes what can happen is you have an employee number um for your p for your paye which basically means pay as you earn um you have an employee number just for your normal contract and then they give you another employee number for your locum contract which is a bit complicated because what it makes HMRC think is that you've got two different jobs when actually you've not. You've got the same job, you're just doing a bit of extra work at the same job. And sometimes they can emergency tax you as a result because they think you've got two jobs and they've done this calculation where you think they think you're going to earn that amount of money for the rest of the year and then overtax you. So what you can do is use that same government gateway account to check what your tax code is, what information they have on you, and you can actually submit requests through that account really easily um, to amend the information they have on you or update them and they're actually really really good so um, definitely check you're on the right tax code at the end of August I'll be doing another one of these and I will literally just be going through the payslip and tax codes nothing else it will be concentrated on that so we will come back to this I won't just leave you alone um, my Instagram page is at the finance medic and I'm going to be posting more um, I'm sorry for how um, how, how much how little I posted on there, um, but it's in my link me, and I'm just going to be adding more to it basically because um, it's all in my brain, and I just don't actually put it put it out. Um, so you've ensured you're on the right tax code, and then self assessments um, to HMRC. That is if you're self employed. Um, again, as an F1 and an F2, even as a core trainee, that's not something you really need to worry about. Um, and that's more if you're making additional income and that means anything over a thousand pounds a year so if you're making more than a thousand pounds a year you have to fill in an hmrc self-assessment to show to tell them how much extra income you're making and if you have to pay more tax if you're making less than an extra for thousand pounds a year then you don't need to do anything um pensions so a lot of people they so our pensions and and again i will give you my um, the page to the pensions because it's very detailed. I actually had a pension expert from Wesleyan come and talk about it as well. And I really highly recommend that you um, go through the article if, if you don't decide to watch the webinar because um, a lot of people, especially early stage doctors, are leaving the NHS pension. And actually that, in my opinion, is a really bad idea. And I'll explain why in my um, in, in on that page and in that webinar. Um, but basically, it does feel like a lot of money is being deducted from your pay slip when you see it, and it is it is a lot of money. But there is a good reason for it. Like the NHS pension is extremely generous for what it is, and to have an equivalent pension that's private, you'd have to put in maybe double, even triple the contributions that you put in now. So. It's actually really worthwhile staying in it, um, especially if you plan on staying in this country. A lot of people ask me, should I stay in it if I'm planning on only being in the UK for two years and then never really coming back? Ah, ha, 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 I, was, I, I beat you to it. Um, so um, if you only plan on being in the UK um, for the two years of foundation training, I wouldn't bother, especially if you're not going to come back and work for the NHS. Don't, don't. Don't um, just opt out of the pension if that's your plan, if you're completely sure. Um, and you can always opt in as well. Um, so say you have your two years and then you decide, oh, I might stick around for some reason. Um, then you can always opt in. So um, at this stage, yeah, I would, if Simon, if I were you, then I will probably opt out. Um, 
If you plan on being a locum for uh, more than just a few shifts here and there, so basically taking a whole year out and locum and things, then you might need some help with tax and mortgage. Um, so get independent final financial advice for that. Um, I have done another um, one on mortgages and um, I talked to a mortgage expert in that webinar um, and his details are in there as well. And I have another excellent financial advisor that I, I've, I really recommend called Glenn Ford, Private Finance. I'll pop those Ill, all in there. Um, right. Oh, I might have double, sorry, yeah. I might just, yeah. And then Glenn Ford, Private Finance. Just Google it. He's based in Newcastle. He's fabulous. He mostly deals with medics. Very good if you need some help on taxes and mortgages. Paying off your student loan. Now, a lot of people go, should I, should I pay off my student loan? And um, I've done another <laughs> article on that, and it's really worth having a look at that because depending on how much your student loan is, it could actually just be almost impossible to do it unless you have a huge amount of money just available at your disposal now. Um, the money saving expert um, said that you might have to just treat it as a 9% um, graduate tax because that's how quickly it's growing. The interest rate is so high that the the amount that you're paying back whilst you're employed is so piddly. Um, like you're never going to actually pay it back. It's just going to keep growing bigger than you can actually pay it back and then it'll get written off in 30. And then now for unfortunately new people, 40 years. So have a read of that, but basically I'm not paying off my student loan early, there's no point, I'm in like 96 plus K thousand pounds worth of debt, there is no way I'm going to pay, pay that off, I'm just treating it as a, as a graduate tax basically, unfortunately. Um, if you leave and go abroad, uh, is it true first couple of months don't get tax? So you get a tax-free personal allowance every tax year and that's £12,570. And basically if you, um, so the way they do it is they front load that. So the, you're right, for the first couple of months you won't pay any tax because the first £12,570 of your income will be tax-free. And then you'll start paying income tax after that. So don't trust the first couple of um, pay slips that you get because it's going to go down, sorry. Um, if you leave to go abroad, will you get the money back you put into the pension? So you can actually get the money back out of the pension, but it will be less than what you would have got if you let the pension keep carrying on. And the thing is, if you say, like, put in one or two years, I'd just get the money out. There's no point sort of leaving it there and faffing about with it. But if you put in a good five to ten years and then you leave, I would suggest leaving the pension as it is, and then it grows with inflation. And anywhere you are in the world, the NHS pension will pay you. It'll pay you into a foreign bank account. So I think if it's like just a couple of years here and there, I would just get the money out of it. But if it's more than that, I would leave it in there to grow with inflation and then just when you retire, draw that pension down at um, UK state pension age, wherever you are in the world. You have to pay some charge to opt out of the pension scheme earlier, right? No, you don't have to do that at all. Um, the, there's, there's no such thing as the charge to opt out of the, the pension. Um, does student loan start coming out the following April after your graduation? Yes, you're right, it does. Unless you are um, a graduate medic, then you will start get being the student loan payments from your first degree will start coming out. If you have had a part-time job in final year, will I get taxed on my pay in August for having two jobs in the same year? Um, yes, you will, and it will even out. They'll get to it, but they might emergency tax you, so I would be careful. I got this and I ended up with a tax bill. Um, because I had a part-time job in the same tax year that I started F1. Um, and then I ended up getting, I had to pay some extra tax actually because I hadn't paid enough tax. So yeah, it might be a bit annoying for you, sorry. Can you opt out at any time of the pension and also opt in? So um, yeah, you can opt out at any time of the pension and you can also opt in at any time of the pension as well. Um, just bear in mind that you have to deal with NHS BSA, which is the Business Services Authority, and they are not very good at getting back to people because they're very busy. They're lots of they have so many people on the tax scheme that you know. Um, I would not depend on being easily being able to just go. Choop, choop, I just want to be in. I just want to be out. It's quite faffy. So just make that in, make that decision with some thought. Um, detailed articles in finance. So I um. 
yep, I gave you links as I went along and I have finished this presentation, I believe. So I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to do some more Q&A for the next 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, I had a part-time job throughout med school. I haven't worked there this financial year, however, I haven't got a P45 yet. I should get this ASAP right. Yeah, I mean, what? yeah, you should, absolutely. But what actually you could do is if you got, sign up on the Government Gateway website, um, you can let them know that you no longer work for them. Um, so they will show you that employer on your, on your account. And then there's an option to basically say, let HMRC know that you no longer work for this company and they'll update that. So, um, you know, don't kill yourself getting that P45. Um, yep. Is it worth getting a private pension on top of the NHS one? I have one. Um, so what I do is I have a, uh, like a strategy for saving. Um, and so what I do is I get my income, then we pay all of our bills, we put um, some money in our emergency fund, we then put some money in an easy access saving account if we need it. We then put a little bit in a stocks and shares ISA. We then put, uh, which is a stocks and shares LISA, by the way. Um, then we put a little bit in my SIP, which is the private pension. Um, and yeah, that's just how I split my savings. Um, and you don't have to put loads. It's just there if you need it. It's an option. Um, as you get more senior and you start earning more, you will start maximising things like your £20,000 ISA allowance and then you'll be like, what do I do with this money? It's not really making anything, it's not really earning anything and I'm paying tax on the interest. And that's when it's quite handy to have a SIP um, because then you can um, put it in there, you get your 20% slash up to 45% tax back and it's quite a, t a tax efficient way of saving, um, but it's kind of like the last thing I put my money in, if that makes sense. How do I opt out of the pension scheme? I was automatically put in it um, at my trust and so I cannot opt out the first two months. Um, you look on the NHS BSA website, Business Services Authority, just Google it, and it'll, you'll have a sort of FAQ, how do I opt out, it'll all be there. Um, it's, it's, it's basically this form that you have to fill in and send them. If you start an online business during FY1, how would you show this on taxes? So that would be through a self-assessment. Um, if that online business is making more than a thousand pounds, then you have to fill in a self-assessment form, which is available on the HMRC website um, by signing up for that government gateway. And if you're making less than a thousand pounds, then you don't have to do anything. What will happen to my existing NHS pension when I move trusts? It will carry on. Where it, it goes with you, so you don't, you don't, um, you basically continue with the same one. Um, uh, yeah, it's the same one. So basically, it's it's connected to your um, national insurance number. So they'll just, you know, it, it's it's connected. Uh, just wanted to check that you can open more than one type of ISA, a cash ration, and ISA. So you can have you can have more than one, but you can only only open one kind of ISA in every tax year. So like one tax year, you'd open a cash ISA. Then the next tax year, you'd open a stocks and shares ISA. Then the tax year after that, you open a normal ISA. So you can only open one type of ISA and like open a new ISA once every tax year. But you can have multiple types of ISAs. And you are allowed to put a maximum of £20,000 across all the different types of ISAs. But you are only allowed to deposit in each type of ISA once. So if you have a lifetime stocks and shares ISA, a lifetime cash ISA, a cash ISA, a stocks and shares ISA, um, then you can, in each of those, you can deposit in one tax year. But if you have, say, two cash ISAs, because you opened one in one tax year and the other in the other tax year, you can't deposit in both of them. You, have, you can only deposit in one of them. So it has to be one type of ISA, not, um, yeah, if that makes sense. Um, I was self-employed throughout medical school. I'm registered with HMRC as self-employed. Do I need to do anything about my registration? No, as long as um, you're not making any, like I said, a thousand pounds is the limit. So if you're making less than a thousand pounds, then you don't have to do anything. If you're making more than a thousand pounds as self-employed, then yes, you do have to do more self-assessments. What are the benefits of a private pension over NHS pension? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Did I... Um, I think I did drop the pension scheme stuff in there. So um, 
have a look at the link and the webinar because I describe each type of pension in um, detail and then I explain the differences between them and um, our Wesleyan pension advisor talks about the comparison between the two and what you would have to do to match each one. Um, based on your income and expenditure, how much money would you say you had left each month during F1? Well, I shared with another F1 during my F1. So um, we um, we kept our cost to a minimum, but actually, like, it was very difficult, to be honest. I think we, um, our rent was a thousand pounds, so 500 each, and then our bills were about between 100 and 200 each. Then we had council tax and food and, and fuel. We lived quite close to the hospital, so luckily fuel wasn't crazy. Um, but we had probably between um, 300 to 400 each left over at the, at the end of the month that we could put into savings. But we were very lucky because we basically rented a one bedroom flat and shared that. Um, so like if you're, if you know, our rent was quite affordable for what it was, um, but I think we were really lucky to get that, to be honest. Which private pension company do you recommend? I don't have any recommendations. I'm not allowed to recommend them. I use free trade um, and my SIP is through free, free trade, but you can have SIPs with Scottish widows. You can have SIPs with um, high street banks, money box, all of them. Um, so have a look. And the reason I do mine through free trade is because I do my ISA through free trade as well. And uh, you pay a monthly fee for free trade, which is a flat fee. And included in that is your stocks and shares ISA and your SIP. So it's not a separate charge, which is why I use it. But that's my reason. So if considering buying a property during foundation training, how long into training would you recommend doing this? Are you three months worth of pay slips or would you be more required at this stage? Um, I would suggest having six months worth of pay slips, especially because um, unfortunately, no matter how hard we try, we, and, and we went with a bank that we thought was experienced with medics, but they were like, oh, you've only got a contract for F1. So, like, we can't accept that. You don't have a contract for F2 yet. And it's like, well, that's not how it works. Like, we are guaranteed the F2 job. Um, so we had to end up showing six months worth of payslips. So I would suggest six months worth of payslips just to be safe. If you wanted to start the process earlier and they're willing to give you a mortgage in principle with three months, then great, absolutely. But, you know... Um, keep in mind that it might have to be six months. Um, after paying for bills and putting aside money for essentials, um, how would you sp suggest spending the rest of the income? Um, at our stage, I would suggest actually making sure that you've got a healthy emergency fund, if I were you, and then putting the rest into something like a LISA. Um, so you're open, yeah, you're completely correct. So an easy access savings account for your emergency fund, and then a LISA for your long-term saving. And I think that's a perfectly reasonable way to use money left over. Um, could you repost the pension link, please? Can um, uh, someone please do that for Meg, if that's okay? And I'll carry on with questions because we've not got much time. Um, what's your opinion about savings accounts now that interest rates have been going up? I've been saving my 4K per year in my LISA and everything above that in premium bonds, but now savings account rates are going up. I'm thinking about switching from premium bonds on. Christopher, are you winning the prizes from the premium bonds? And how regularly are you winning them? And then what I would do is I would compare the percentage return you're getting on those premium bonds with the prizes compared to the current uh, savings rate. Um, so, for example, my parents use premium bonds, um, and I, I really like premium bonds myself as well. Um, but and, and basically, they win enough little checks that they're making more of a return in their premium bonds than they would in the best current fixed-term five-year saving account. So they're sticking with premium bonds, and I, I, you know, so basically, calculate what you're doing. And if you think you could make a better return from the current savings accounts that are in place and that you're willing to lock away your money for X amount of time, move it, no problem. But otherwise, I think premium bonds are actually quite a good shout if you're making a regular um, little prizes from them. Can you clarify the multiple ISA point? So you can, yes, so you can have a LISA and an ISA at the same time, but you can't open more than one type of ISA in one tax year, but they can exist at the same time. I had a flexible shift job and you get taken off the list when inactive for a while. My last shift was last June. Do I need to do any extra notifying HMRC? It depends. Like I had one of those jobs where I worked at um, 
the NEC arena as someone who sold merch and like I was inactive on their list for like probably a year but they still hadn't notified HMRC that I'd left so I think it's worth like just signing up on the government gateway account and clicking that I no longer work for this pay this thing instead of just getting messed up in all of that if they haven't bothered to actually let HMRC know that you don't work for them. Um, how does it generally work with a mortgage in terms of how with trainee you might be relocated quite far? Um, mortgages, no, mortgages can't be transferred between properties. So um, we're coming uh, on to like this, this is difficult, absolutely. Um, and you have to make the balance between do you want to buy a house here and then try and get your training here? Are you happy if you got your training elsewhere to rent out your house here and and then pay rent elsewhere? Do you think you could sell your house here and buy a house elsewhere? Like you, those are really difficult questions and ones you have to ask yourself. It it doesn't. There's not like a a helpful process in place or anything like that. It literally is just these very difficult questions of what you want to do with your life. And sometimes, like for me, it's really frustrating to see your rent like just paying someone else's mortgage and you do want to actually just you know have your mortgage and, and and treat it as an investment and if you want to do that then go for it and if you get you know thrown across a different part of the country then you can rent it out and you you know then pay rent in a new place um but yeah these are quite hard questions to to kind of you, you're gonna have to think about it and what's what's important to you um, so for both of those accounts, can you keep paying into it or are you only one of those ICEs? So you can pay once into each different type of ISA. So yes, you could put 4K in the LISA and then 16K in the ISA in the same financial year. Yes. Um, you could even put, I'm going to complicate things and make things more confusing. So you can put 4K in your stocks and shares LISA. You can also put 4K in your cash LISA. You'll only get a 25% bonus on one of those, not both. You can then put another 200 pounds in your help to buy ISA. And then you can put another, um, whatever I've got left, I'm not done the maths fast enough, um, split between a cash ISA and a stocks and shares ISA all in the same tax year. So basically you can deposit once in each, not once, as in you can deposit in one kind of ISA each per tax year. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I don't understand the transfer thing. I've never heard of that. You'd have to literally sell the house and then get your money back and then buy a new house and get a new mortgage. I have never heard of a mortgage transfer in the UK, at least. That's not something I've ever heard of. Unless they've done it, then they that would be magical and we'll find out. Any more questions, guys? Do banks accept Logan Bay during F3 as your salary if you get a mortgage then? Yeah, so actually um, I talk about it in my mortgage webinar um, and both Glenn Ford and Tom in the mortgage webinar talk about helping locums get um, their mortgages and basically um, they need more payslips, so basically six to nine months worth of payslips to show that they're making a regular income. Um, and you can let yeah, people who pay mortgage uh, who are locums can still get mortgages. Um, and yes, I would. So personally, like it is difficult because um, the average house price has gone up, and the multipliers for our salary have remained the same since like people had house prices were only like two, three times the annual salary. And now they're about eight times the annual salary, but our multipliers with banks have stayed between three and four times the annual salary. So it is worth if you depending on the kind of place you want to get, if you need a bigger mortgage, then you're going to have to wait. Can you tell us about prevalent scams that bank put in contracts and how to avoid or negotiate them? I'm that's um, that's not something I can do. I'm sorry. Um, if you have savings for a house deposit but you want to wait until specialty training to buy somewhere, what's the best way of protecting your savings losing value due to inflation? I would suggest putting it in a stocks and shares LISA 
um, rather than a cash LISA because you will end up, um, it, the interest rate won't grow. That's a really valid question. The interest rate won't grow the same as inflation. Whereas um, in a stocks and shares LISA, especially done well, um, and you can get them managed if you don't know very much about it, um, the growth would be slightly higher and hopefully inflation busting. Um, so you can deposit up to a limit of each ISA into each type of ISA. You have up into an overall limit per tax year. Yes, exactly. Is a council tax a UK-wide expense? Yes, it is. Are there stocks and shares ISAs that aren't LISAs? Yes. So you can get a stocks and shares ISA and you can get a stocks and shares LISA. Um, stocks and shares ISA, you can actually are uh, easy access, by the way. They're not like LISAs where you can't touch the money. Is not a stocks and shares LISA risky because you not lose more than you can gain? Yep, um, stocks and shares is always risky. You can always lose more than you can gain. Um, and that's completely up to you and your risk appetite. Um, and I will never guarantee that you will make more in one or the other. Um, but it, it's, it's just an option if you, I mean, you either have the guaranteed inflation uh, devaluation of your money or you have the possibility that you'll be able to have an inflation busting investment with the risk that it might go down um, and there's lots of very useful um, investing um, resources out there so you don't have to jump into anything and put your entire life savings into it you can start with you know 50 quid 100 quid see where you go would you recommend opening a life for someone who wants to buy a house in the next one to two years yes I would because you, you, if you manage to put £8,000 in there over the next two years and then you get your government bonus of £2,000 over that, you've got a 10 k deposit in two years by putting in £8,000. That's brilliant. Even if we already have a help to buy and applying on using that. Um, like we already talked about that earlier, but basically you could transfer what's in your help to buy into your um, LISA if you want. It depends what you want to use it for. So if you have enough in your um, help to buy, then use your help to buy. If you don't have enough in your help to buy, then it might be worth putting it in a LISA so that you can actually put some extra money into it. Because you can put up to £4,000 in the LISA, but you can only put 2400 in a help to buy and actually just pump that up a little bit. So um, again, that's dependent on what you want to do, what your time frames are, how much money you have available in each one. Um, is council tax split amongst the housemates or is it individual? So um, it's the address that's taxed. Um, so you would have to work, um, work it out between you um, and pay that as one, it would be in one person's name um, and then you would have to pay it between you. I'm just looking for the feedback link. I hope I can find it easily. Uh, oh, there we go. So there's a feedback link. Please, please fill it in because it does help me and I change everything every time I do these to reflect the feedback. Um, when is a webinar about mortgages, FY3, you mentioned? Um, so I've done a webinar about it already. I won't be doing another one. Um, but uh, let me put the link back in. Um, watch the webinar because Tom talks about his locum um, clients in that one. Did, do you, did you do an accounting degree? I used to be a chartered accountant before I became a doctor. So I am an ACA qualified chartered accountant and a lot older than most of my colleagues. Um, hopefully I don't look in. Um, cool, I really appreciate all your questions. They're actually really good. Um, and you guys are so on top of it. I know you're gonna smash things. Which of these options you've mentioned are valid if you move abroad after FY2 and are any of them not worth getting? Um, if you're moving abroad after FY2, there's no real point. To have The ISA is probably the best one because you can actually get the money out of it. Whereas the LISA and the help to buy, you, you can only use the help to buy to actually buy a new house, otherwise you just don't get the bonus. The LISA, again, you are, can only use to buy a new house um, if you're retiring at 60 in the UK and if you have less than 12 months to live. So the ISA is probably the only one, um, if I were you. Um,
uh, if you just put in the comments that you're a medical student, don't worry. This was this was directed at graduates, but you know, I hope you found it useful at least. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, yeah, so if you want, um, I've. I'm just going to put my uh, Instagram again because that's the best way to get in touch if you have any more questions. Um, and then I'm also on um, finance at mind. Uh, this is my email address as well if you had any more questions. So, yeah, fabulous. Um, lovely spending the evening with you. I am starving and I'm going to go have dinner. Bye.